It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry LeSeur and Winston Burdett. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Joseph R. Farrington, Congressional Delegate from Hawaii. Mr. Farrington, this is a great time of the year here on the mainland to be talking about sunny Hawaii. But I wonder if you, as uh, the Congressional Delegate from Hawaii, would refresh our memories a bit about uh, what you refer to as the Paradise of the Pacific. Hawaii is situated about 2,400 miles uh, southwest of San Francisco. It is just inside of the tropics and in the pathway of the trade winds, and that explains the very uh, beautiful climate that uh, we, we enjoy in Hawaii. In land area, it has something over 6,000 square miles. That's about equal to Connecticut and Rhode Island. And it consists of eight main islands, which are uh, uh, spread over a distance of about 350 miles. The uh, islands are geologically rather new. They're of volcanic origin, and because of, relatively speaking, recent origin, uh, we don't have any minerals. We just have a, a very fertile soil and a very fine climate as are two great resources. Well, Mr. Farrington, what is the present status of the Hawaiian statehood bill, and what are its prospects at this session of Congress, would you say? The bill to admit Hawaii to a union as a state was passed uh, by the House in the last session and is now pending uh, before the Senate Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs. The latter committee began hearings last May and continued them through the summer and concluded them only last Friday. The committee, incidentally, was to meet this morning but there was a heavy snowfall in Washington, and so they postponed the meeting to tomorrow morning. And at that time, they will determine just what the procedure will be. Uh, this uh, is the time of decision on the Hawaiian statehood legislation. Well, do you think it's possible that uh, Hawaii may become a state during this next second session of the 83rd Congress? Uh, I hope that it uh, becomes a state, and I think the prospects <coughs> for winning statehood are far better than ever before. In fact, they're very good. The President, you'll recall, in his State of the Union message, asked for the enactment of the Hawaiian Statehood Bill. And the leadership of the, of the Senate has placed it among the first three measures to be considered. Mr. Farrington, may I ask, uh, would there be any advantages to us in the United States or to Hawaii itself if you did become a state? The advantages to uh, of the United States are very, very marked, in my opinion. Uh, it will bring the people of Hawaii much closer to the uh, uh, people of the states and will constitute the final step in the integration of the life of what is really our western outpost with the rest of the country. We're closely integrated economically, uh, spiritually, so to speak, and in every way except politically. This is the final uh, step. It will enhance our uh, uh, position from a defense a standpoint because it will uh, give notice to the uh, people of the world and partic particularly to the Pacific that the United States is not retreating beyond Hawaii. Well, may I ask, is uh, Hawaii defensible? We all remember Pearl Harbor, of course. I don't think there's any question uh, about that. And I think that uh, uh, we're coming uh, back to uh, the thinking that existed prior to the war that uh, uh, there is uh, a pri th that we have in Hawaii a primary base. We have, of course, a perimeter of, uh, of defense outposts uh, far ahead in the Pacific, as everyone knows, but that hasn't at all weakened uh, the importance of Hawaii. And on the contrary, it strengthened it. That was very well demonstrated during the uh, Korean uh, the conflict uh, when uh, uh, the necessity of keeping the sea and air lanes open between the states in uh, 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 Korea. Well, Mr. Farrington, would... Uh, uh, would uh, statehood for Hawaii enhance our political position in Asia? I don't think there's any question about it. And that offers one of the greatest reasons 
for the admission of Hawaii to the Union as a, a state. The people of Hawaii are, for the most part, American citizens. I think today that probably less than 10 percent uh, of them are aliens. But they're American citizens whose parents came there from the, in large part from the Far East. There are more people in Hawaii of a Japanese origin, Chinese origin, Filipino origin, and Korean origin than the rest of the country combined. And they have been united in the American tradition and uh, intensely loyal to this country, and their parents and relatives in their home countries are watching to see whether the United States will fulfill uh, the promise of statehood uh, in order to, uh, uh, that would give them the same status uh, of, every other of every other American. Mr. Farrington, uh, do you think the people of Hawaii would be uh, greatly disappointed if they were not to get statehood at this time, and would that have political effects? Might, if I may say so, might they go democratic? There's no question that they would be very uh, greatly disappointed. Uh, being a Republican, I trust that they won't uh, turn to the Democratic uh, Party by way of expressing their, their disappointment. Uh, I think that uh, uh, you can't, you, you're not likely to expect any immediate ill effects of the failure of that statehood legislation, but in the long run, it will do an irreparable amount of damage to one of the great experiments in American democracy. Because the only alternative to statehood for Hawaii is colonialism. And we know from the record of recent years that uh, ultimately colonialism holds the seeds of its own destruction. Well, Mr. Farrington, how do the people of Hawaii feel right now about the prospects for statehood? Are they pessimistic or optimistic after the long history of the I campaign think for it? I think they, they are uh, they're very hopeful, but underlying that is an element of skepticism. They're uh, waiting uh, very watchfully, so to speak. Mr. Farrington, there seems to be criticism from both sides of the political spectrum against Hawaiian statehood. And one of the criticisms I've heard is that to make Hawaii into a state would be turning over too much control to the five uh, great missionary families who founded it. Then there are other critics who contend that it might be giving control to the Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union, which I believe was expelled from the CIO as That's too right. red. Of course, those two elements in the uh, population represent the two extremes. The so-called big five who are the factors that represent the basic agricultural uh, uh, industries uh, uh, represent uh, the represent management uh, the leadership incidentally the influences that have effectively developed the resources of the islands on the other hand the uh, international warehousemen and longshoremen's union represent an extremely militant union and one whose leadership has been described as communist, and whose leader, of course, Harry Bridges, has been tried on the charges resulting out of his alleged communism. Uh, well, Mr. Farrington, uh, since the bulk of Hawaii's population is of mixed race, as I remember, uh, wouldn't uh, the uh, senators and uh, representatives who would represent Hawaii in our Congress reflect that mixed population? I think that's all, all altogether possible, as that's what uh, has happened in our legislature and in our government generally. Uh, for 20 years, for instance, Hawaii was represented by Prince Jonah Kuhil Kalaniana Oli, who was a Hawaiian uh, prince. Uh, the present governor of the territory of Hawaii, Samuel Wiley King, is very proud of the fact that he is one-eighth Hawaiian, descended on the one side from a Scotch sea captain and on the other side from a family of Hawaiian chiefs. Uh, Mr. Farrington, you said earlier you were quite optimistic uh, with regard to passage of the statehood bill at this session. What basis do you have for being especially optimistic this year? There are several reasons. One of them, and I'd say this is the primary reason, is that the administration and the leadership of Congress is strongly committed to the enactment of that legislation in this session of Congress. It was promised in the... Uh, uh, Republican and Democratic platforms of 1952. And another reason for it is the rising tide of public sentiment in favor of statehood for Hawaii. The last Gallup poll, for instance, shows that 78% of the people of the country 
favor statehood for Hawaii. I think the force of public opinion uh, will inevitably make Hawaii a state of the union. Uh, well, Mr. Farrington, I'd like to bring up just a, another point in regarding the objections to uh, Hawaiian statehood, and that is that there is some fear in the, our South that this might uh, make precedence against segregation. Is that right? No, I don't think so. I, I think the attitude of the people um, of Hawaii towards uh, ra race is in the traditional American pattern, as distinguished uh, from that in uh, those areas of the country where they do uh, practice segregation. We do not have segregation in Hawaii. On the other hand, I want to say this, that we in Hawaii believe the problem of race should be dealt with on a local basis and that the people of Hawaii should be allowed to work out their program themselves and the, other, and the people in other parts of the country should do likewise. It's a problem that has got to be met by education and social adjustment rather than by law. Uh, we ask that our position be respected and we, with the, in that regard, and we respect the position of others also. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Farrington. It's a great pleasure to have you here in the studio tonight. Thank you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Winston Burdett. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Joseph R. Farrington, Congressional Delegate from... Hawaii. A priceless attribute of every Longines watch is pride of possession. It brings to its owner the satisfaction of knowing that he owns the watch of highest prestige among the finest watches of the world. Yes, a Longines watch brings to its owner more than the delight of a beautiful possession, more than the unsurpassed timekeeping of a remarkable watch. For that Longines watch of yours is the one and the only world's most honored watch. Only Longines, among the world's finest watches, has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors from government observatories, and a position of preference in sports, aviation, and in science. For an anniversary, a birthday, for any important gift occasion, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines. Yet unbelievably, you may buy an own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.